frequency meter. Yeah, it's a kind of how is it called? Beat beat note frequency mm -hmm. meter. Mm -hmm. The first <laughs> generation of frequency meters. You have a beat uh, oscillator in there, and you compare the harmonics with the measurement frequency. You can uh, the frequency meter. Mm -hmm. um, that is. Uh, Is it a, it's a pulse generator, I think. Um, I don't know the exact ranges. Uh, pulse within microseconds, yes, it's a pulse generator. 1 to 20 microseconds with, with uh, pulse with polarity switch able. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, this uh, his special uh, spectrum analyzers. He, his main uh, spectrum analyzers. Um, one was a mixer defect, so we have only one functional. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, the range is uh, is very large, actually, from twenty. Uh, said a kilo mega cycle, so this is forty giga cycles mm -hmm. down to mega cycles. Uh, 10 megacycles to 40 gigacycles, so mm -hmm. that's, that's quite a range. <laughs> but uh, it's a very old spectrum analyzer <laughs> yeah, yeah, with, yeah. without uh, reselector and without separation of the mixing products, so it's very mm -hmm. hard to use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is a game frequency generator. It's a range. That is the attenuator. Mm, here, mega cycles, 450, up to 1.2 mega cycles. Mm -hmm. Again, standard oscilloscope with time base in the microsecond range. What? Okay, uh, that's um, what's exactly. Teleometer, it's, it's, it's from this. Uh, it's uh, some kind of resonant measurement meter. I don't see the dial actually, which range. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's again a cavity, you tune the cavity, there's a rectifier, and mm -hmm. you can measure the resonance of the cavity. So, uh, contributors here have spent many months uh, cleaning this equipment and uh, repairing it. Uh, mostly, as I understand, uh, finding old uh, electrolytic capacitors and replacing those, and more besides. Uh, so, the equipment is functional right now, um, and it, it really needs uh, the right antennas and the understanding of the antennas uh, that are needed and the arrangement. Um, now, there are some Hutchison samples here. Um, uh, this is a large aluminium billet, and this is another billet, same diameter approximately. And uh, one thing I was discussing with them yesterday is that uh, in Hutchison's work, uh, when he shows off a lot of his samples, uh, there tends to be this uh, effect occurring at n lambda plus a half lambda, which is essentially what you use for ultrasonics. Uh, and so here you have a half wave uh, between here and here, potentially, um, that uh, is causing an effect to occur in the dead center uh, where the resonance uh, uh, is uh, maximum. Uh, and here it's like one, one third in from, from the end. Uh, and there was some research done, uh, published in 1959 and, and then in New Scientist, I think in 1964, where they were using uh, up to 10 gigahertz uh, microwave, uh, I think at around about 10 gigahertz, the, there's something to do with the atomics uh, uh, that, that means that it doesn't exhibit this effect. But they were using a piece of quartz and they were shooting uh, microwaves into it and then turning off the microwave pulse and 
from the end where the, the signal was going in, the, the microwaves were going into the piezo uh, effect, uh, properties of the quartz, and it was sending a sound wave that had in, in, inside that sound wave the frequency that was initially impinging on it, and it would come down, bounce off the, the impedance mismatch at this end, reflect off there, come out, and, and then re-emit um, uh, electromagnetic waves. And you would get pulses, pulses, and the pulses were separated by the time it took to travel and reflect down the, the bar. So um, essentially what you've got is some sort of overlaid um, uh, frequency component onto the traveling sound wave, uh, onto the phonon. Um, and so uh, maybe that's something like what's going on in here. Um, it, all aluminium will have aluminium oxide on it. Does that help with the impedance mismatch from the microwaves coming in to uh, going into the metal? Uh, who knows? Um, but I'll share those papers and publications uh, uh, for consideration. So uh, one thing I was also discussing is that it tended to be um, uh, cylindrical billets like these or um, uh, spheres that were very um, good for the Hutchison effect. And essentially what I'm seeing, therefore, thinking about this, is that you have a resonance that is down the length, which is, as I said, uh, n lambda plus a half, like you would do in ultrasonics design. Um, and then you probably have a resonance that's across the diameter. So um, what uh, uh, Thomas Bearden is saying is that when you get the field interference between two electromagnetic waves uh, such that uh, where they ze zero sum, uh, you get electrogravity. And that, in combination with uh, something like the Van de Graaff generator or the Tesla coil uh, up there, uh, potentially is able to create the Hutchison effect. And as, as I've discussed in previous videos, aluminium seems to be the most susceptible to this effect. And I've suggested that since it's uh, an electron-based effect, um, uh, and electrons hold the metal lattice together, that the, um, the induced, let's say it's charge clusters that are induced into them affect aluminium because of the uh, 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 low melting point, i.e. its ability to hold the lattice together is lowest in aluminium of the very high melting point, sorry, of the very high conductivity elements. It's number four in the list. Now, in sonofusion, Russ George found that silver uh, was by far the most active uh, material uh, in sonofusion, and, and uh, the, the foils maybe exploded or whatever. Um, the interesting thing is, obviously, silver is the most conductive element. Now, because John was often taking his metals from scrap heaps uh, or just standard billets, you wouldn't really want to be uh, getting a lump of silver this big um, uh, to try the experiment on just because you, you didn't even know that it was going to work. But it might be interesting to try silver.